Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Chi Ming Peng, uh, Secretary General of TCP. Uh, you are wondering why is TCP is the Taiwan Climate Partnership, and that uh, our founder is there. <laughs> AUO, Delta, TSMC, Microsoft is an ICT company in Taiwan, and they are not also the local company. It's the international company because we found the importance of climate change. About three years ago, we organized together. So that's why we in the beginning we have only about eight founding member right now we have a 100 and uh, this year we also open one financial interview the full bank holding to join us the only one because we know the green finance is very important so uh today topic is the green finance and uh, we all we know uh everyone we want to climate change the finance is the most important things although i am a, a meteorologist i know everything about the finance i work for finance every day living by finance but for like, climate change issues the green finance how to do this is very very important even when we talk about the nuclear you tax money something something everything think with green finance so today we have two speakers talking about that and we also have friend online to join us and uh, uh, we have two speakers the first speaker is uh, Dr. Chepel Mosa and he is a partner and decarbonization and the climate risk of KBNG Netherlands and the second, second uh, speaker is Sean Kidney uh, he is a CEO of Climate Bonds Initiate very one interesting about this so maybe later on we can have a talk about this uh, Chepel maybe the floor is yours you have about 15 minutes is okay yeah okay thank you and i will of the audience online you can ask question in in our uh, chat room okay please yeah you can use this micro okay okay, okay. let's see let's see okay no 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 it's working no not yet okay Okay, so thank you so much uh, for everyone online also uh, welcome. Um, we hear a lot about uh, climate finance. You mentioned the importance of climate finance. Uh, already uh, the first few days of this uh, COP, uh, there has been a lot of uh, talks about funds being initiated uh, and about money starting to flow into funds. Uh, what I will talk about today is actually a bit more from the financial institution because, of course, the big funds being announced by governments, etc., uh, those are mainly public, public money uh, that flows through governments. But for real economy, it's the financial institution who uh, basically fund projects, fund activities, um, and today how banks and or financial institutions are positioning in climate finance is quite important. So what I will talk about, and then I will hand over to Sean, who can talk maybe a bit more about the, the, the tool and the uh, vehicles uh, of, of this channeling, is how banks are usually approaching real economies. The first thing is today, when we look at climate finance from a financial institution, of course, it can flow into any activity that is, uh, that is labeled green. But where we see mainly the focus is in five key sectors, oil and gas, uh, uh, commercial real estate, iron and steel, power generation and cement sector. Now, why these focus? Because you might think that, hey, oil and gas is not really a climate finance or a green finance. But for banks to decarbonize their portfolio, they need to address the portfolio companies or uh, the finance they give to oil and gas sector. The same for the cement sector, because ultimately, if we are to decarbonize our economies, we need to decarbonize all the sector in the economy. And those sectors are basically the carbon intensive or the most hard to abate sector. So only providing finance to renewable energy or uh, alternative energy or energy efficiency is not enough to decarbonize our economy and to go to net zero because we will be leaving behind 
the sectors that are re, uh, that are carbon intensive. Um, and this is why today, if we look at how banks or financial institutions are positioning towards greening their portfolio, we see that, for example, cement and iron and steel are becoming important all over the world, even in Taiwan, if they uh, export their product into Europe, especially today with SIBA. So attracting funds and being uh, 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 climate, let's say, uh, or, 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 or have targets towards a net zero is very important for company in order to remain uh, uh, competitive in the market. Now, when we talk about, okay, there is a lot of terminologies out there uh, on greening the financial institution. You might have heard of GFANS. There is SBTI, of course, the science-based target initiatives. They have, a, they have a guidelines for the financial institution, but there is also the NZBA, the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Um, and today, a lot of companies are a bit confused, like, what can we do? What do we follow? What is best to attract funds? There is no right or wrong. Each initiative has, has its pros and cons. Okay, let's, let's have a discussion. Let's have a, let's have a discussion. Let's have a discussion. I would love to have a discussion. Because indeed, if we are going towards climate science, gold, the gold standard is the SBTI. Um, and the SBTI today help organization in order to achieve a, 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 a zero carbon economy. However, we need to recognize that our economies need different approaches per sectors because some sectors are harder to abate than others. This is where the NZBA, the Net Zero Banking Alliance, comes into the picture because it's a sector uh, alliance that is very much aligned with SBTA, but takes into account the reality of the banking sector. And this is why there is a little bit of flexibility into NZBA uh, uh, guidelines versus SBTI guidelines. Um, if you can see that both uh, initiatives have a very big attractive attraction uh, into the financial institution, NZBA, of course, is much more recent than SBTI. They are aligned with SBTI on the longer term, but they provide a bit more flexibility on the short term specifically around the decarbonization of uh, financial institution portfolios. But again, uh, 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 SBTI is really the gold standard toward a net zero 2050. Now, um, if we are, or if a financial institution would like, before today providing just climate finance, Financial institutions are starting to put certain targets in order to put a dot on the horizon and then the financial product or the financial uh, uh, um, uh, finance they are providing, it's toward these targets. Now, um, the science-based target initiative does provide a lot of sectoral guidance approach that banks or financial institutions can use in order to uh, determine criteria for their sectoral companies and then according it provide a climate finance or green finance or or uh, establish new type of uh, of uh, of solution financial solution the net zero banking allow uh, uh, the net zero banking alliance they are also developing but because they are re more recent than sbti they are developing sectoral uh, uh, based approaches um, um, as I mentioned before, overall, today banks are still trying to figure out how to approach basically decarbonization of their portfolio, how to provide climate finance, and how to remain real to uh, the economies. Because even if banks would like to provide all their available money towards, let's say, decarbonized projects, and there is not enough of projects, then banks will be out of uh, out of uh, uh, out of business. So, what we see today is that, in general, within the financial institution and maybe a bit in in Europe, there is an availability of fund, but not necessarily enough availability of project that meets stringent criteria. And this is why banks, especially European banks, again are looking all over the world 
for project that meets that meets their criteria. Um, I will not I will not go into too much uh, uh, about how SBTI treats the approach uh, versus NZBA, but it's quite important to know that even SBTI today, uh, which is again following the science, do treat different sectors differently when it comes to net zero. On the long term, all sectors need to get to net zero by 2050. This is what the science tells us. But in the next five to 10 years, so when we look at 2030, 2035, not all sectors can achieve the same emission reduction. Some sector can achieve 40, 46, 50 percent. Other sector can only achieve 20, 23 percent. And SBTI have taken this into account. And this is starting also to affect how financial institution takes their target and basically channel their, their funds uh, 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 towards the different sectors. NZBA uh, is very similar, but again, NZBA on the longer term is, is aligned with uh, uh, SBTI on the shorter term, there is a little bit of flexibility. Now, when banks set their ambition and then they set, let's say, new type of product, uh, or vehicles in order to channel climate finance, we see three key action being taken. The first is they determine the direction of travel for net zero. So the direction of travel for net zero is at which pace they want to start channeling uh, uh, climate finance. What percentage of their portfolio they want to allocate to what sector? We are not, as KPMG at least, we are not uh, in favor of exclusion policies. Because yes, banks can say we don't want to finance on the short term at least. We don't want to finance, let's say, oil and gas. We don't want to finance cement. We don't finance steel. But the reality is our economy still needs those sectors. Our economy has not yet pivoted in order to have new type of concrete or new type of steel or only green steel. This is why rather than going through uh, exclusion policies, it's today banks are setting certain uh, uh, roadmaps and direction of travel that in include the pace of decarbonization and they are channeling their funds according to this pace of decarbonization. The second thing is they are aligning with the industry initiatives. So it's not really a top-down approach where banks say, I will do, you know, 50% reduction in the cement industry. Because simply, if the cement industry cannot achieve 50%, the banks will not be able to achieve this on their own portfolio company. And the third thing is, they are not taking all sector at one go. So they are really uh, uh, selecting or prioritizing the sector where they channel their climate finance. And this is quite important in where we see uh, uh, when it comes to attraction of climate finance is that the sectors that are working to get technologies or green technology or low carbon technology better embedded into their operation are starting to attract uh, uh, funding or are starting to engage with financial institution better. Now, if I talk a little bit about regulation, of course, there is CBAM, uh, and this CBAM is putting pressure on non-European company to implement uh, uh, initiatives or technologies that are low carbon. But next to that, there is the EU taxonomy that is providing stringent criteria on what can be called as, let's say, green finance or sustainable finance. EU taxonomy is a double-edged sword because on one hand, it does provide a level of credibility and then it does incentivize company to channel funds into uh, activity that are considered uh, sustainable. On the other hand, some activities in certain sectors that are not considered uh, 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 sustainable, like for example, in the chemical industry, are starting to have uh, a little bit of challenges in, in attracting finance or in attracting um, let's say enough finance. So even today, we start to see that the green tax, uh, that the EU taxonomy that was mainly driven from the financial, let's say, flow of money is also starting to have an impact 
on the companies themselves that wants to attract finance and that wants to be part of the EU taxonomy uh, uh, to 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 take to take measures themselves to be to be aligned with uh, with sustainable activities, so to speak. Um, now, what do we see in general? Banks going around a certain journey in order to determine how to deploy their green finance, and this journey starts by looking at their portfolio, start at understanding their own portfolio, and prioritize which company. Then, as we mentioned, basically determining what ambition they want or what is the uh, 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 what is the uh, uh, direction of travel they want to take, which sector they want to take first, which sector they want or which activities in which sector they want to uh, uh, channel their green finance or what they label as sustainable finance through. Right. Then they set targets in order to make sure that part of their portfolios really go into those type of activity and at the end you know they take action what we see today in again challenging is three scenarios the first is climate finance people think that climate finance carries more risk than normal finance which is not necessarily the same because let me give you an example today if we go to take car loan, whether we're taking a loan for a fuel-powered car or an electric-powered car, the risk on the loan is the same. Now, of course, in certain assets, especially in certain industry with heavy assets, we go into different type of risk. But I wanted to mention that not every green finance has necessarily a differential risk profile than uh, normal finance. As such, not every green finance should be maybe a higher percentage or a differential percentage than, uh, uh, than conventional finance. Scenario two is that today there are certain green technology that have been very well established and they have proven the business case. Their climate finance should be cheaper than conventional finance. And the third is basically the new technologies that still are not well understood where their risk are not yet fully, uh, uh, let's say, calculated. And this is where we see a differential, especially a positive differential in the interest rate versus conventional finance. And the discussion here becomes, if you are providing us finance that is more expensive, how basically are you incentivizing the implementation of these green technologies? So this is where we see now most of the most of the discussion. But like any technology, we follow the technology curve and those technology will become uh, less risky or de-risk at one point and will attract uh, uh, hopefully better finance. So this is what I wanted to say for now. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, open for the discussion. Really, really keen on it. Okay. Uh, maybe, but I, I have a quick question uh, to uh, Shabelle. I'm wondering, the G fence, you mentioned about the uh, banks. G fence is a big umbrella, and you mentioned about the banks. But I just I know some of the banks claim they just join, and uh, they have the ambition, but what they think is they cannot reach the goal at all. There were lots of difficulties yes, about, yes. about this one. How what's the situation right now? Again, we have to recognize that net zero and decarbonizing our world. There is a lot of talk, there are a lot of pledges, but we know that actions are not fast enough. We are not, I mean, not me saying that, IPCC is saying that, we are not doing enough to meet or to be on the trajectory we have to be on. Okay, now, banks can make pledges, but ultimately, if the real economy doesn't move, banks cannot meet their pledges. What we see today is that the decarbonization of the key sector in our economies are not go or is not going fast enough in order to decarbonize our economy at the pace we need. Today, there has been many banks who said, I want to decarbonize my portfolio by 20%, by 25%, by 40%, by 2030. They can ultimately, what is the levers they have? They can say, I don't invest in a company anymore. Okay, fine, but this goes ultimately against business or they can engage and today banks are engaging with their clients. So they are moving from or at least there is a move from exclusion to engagement. 
So rather than saying we don't give fund, we engage, but engagement put them at a basically certain position of control where they cannot force company to act, but they can incentivize company to act. And if company don't act fast enough, banks cannot decarbonize their portfolio fast enough. So to answer long, long, long intro, but to answer your question, banks or some banks were quite eager to be very ambitious, but then they are facing the realities of the real economy. And this is where today there is a big discussion like, okay, you know, how, where do we position? Do we position ahead or do we position as an enabler for, for the real economy to decarbonize? Oh, but your data shows that very limited banks joined the alliance. Not every bank. What about the others did not join? What's their future? I, well, I, 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 I cannot speak, but, but again, like, like many initiatives, and, and hopefully, again, Sean will mention, any initiative starts with, like yourself, you start with the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the launchers, you start yes. with the one who's, who launch, yes. and then you build momentum and year after year. Now, the fact that SBTI or NZBA have so many banks already today, right? It's, it's something that we should build on. There is enough momentum to build on. But again, not every bank in every economy, we have to recognize that some economies today, decarbonization is not necessarily priority for them, right? So not every bank today is in the same position as maybe, you know, the global banks or banks in advanced economies. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's welcome the Sean Kenny. Okay, you can use this one. Use that? Your boss. Hey, I have options. This is great. This is what we need, options. It's challenging. I'm the CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative. We're a global NGO working to mobilize capital for climate action. Let's just understand what we're dealing with to pick up on, on some of the comments my, my, my friend said earlier. We had last year, the G20, commit to 1.5 degree maximum warming on the planet. You might remember the Paris Agreement said two degrees, 1.5 if we can, because major nations were not willing to commit to two. Climate science has advanced since then. Climate scientists will tell you very clearly, two degrees is unsustainable. Our planet will be unbearable for human beings at two degrees and we trigger so many feedback loops, we will see warming of a six to eight degrees by the end of the century. Unbearable. Understand the ramifications of this. If we do continue on what is still the current trajectory of change, we will expect to see changes to the global environment that will make it impossible for human beings to survive. This is an extinction event that we're looking at. This is not about creating a slightly more comfortable future for our kids. On the current trajectory of climate change, we are looking at substantial risk of extinction of the species and many other species with it. We already have the highest level of species lost on the planet since the meteor hit Yucatan years ago and wiped out dinosaurs. This is human induced, but we're doing it to ourselves. That's the background to all of this. Now, the bad news about the G20 target agreed last November, is that according to the World Meteorological Organization, we will actually get there in, in 2027. We've lost already. It's very important to understand this. We have failed monumentally as a species to address what our own scientists have been telling us very clearly now for the last 35 years that we have to do. The crazy thing about this is it's not hard. The solutions are absolutely clear and present. Yes, it is challenging, but from a technology perspective, there is no barrier to the change we have to make. Technology will improve the speed of transition, but we know how to do clean energy. We know how to do green steel. We know how to do low carbon concrete. We know how to do sustainable agriculture. None of these things are research and development. None. Yes, there's some cost issues, but the truth is, our economy has been managed with public policy constraints for the last 200 years anyway. We make decisions to make seat belts compulsory in airplanes to stop people dying no matter what the cost. We just do it, then everyone has to follow. 
we make decisions to electrify our societies and stop people burning fire, every, burning wood everywhere for a variety of reasons, including cost. We just do it. And we're in that similar kind of position in life. We do need to understand because we have failed so spectacularly, climate change is happening. Typhoons in Taipei are going to be two times to possibly three times as intense by 2050. We have to prepare. That will mean changing our building codes. That will mean changing our coastal land management planning because we're going to get tsunamis or tidal waves, I should say, coming through. We're going to get more floods, as we saw in Taiwan in the last few months. We're going to get droughts in between. Resilience is now a big agenda item. That's the bad news, but it's important to just understand this is not a small issue. This is not about how we gently change things. This has, because we have failed to act, now become a cliff we have to jump off in terms of change. Okay, positives. We are lucky in one way. We do have the solutions. They have to be scaled up. They have to be made cheaper. We have to invest in learning rates, as we have done, by the way, in things like the semiconductor industry in Taiwan over the last 30 years, where the cost of doing semiconductors continues to drop. We have not done that in key areas of change, apart from solar and wind, where thanks to the German government, in 2001, and then the mainland Chinese government in 2006, we have seen extraordinary state-backed investments in renewable energy, which has driven the price down. It has not been clever companies. It has not been R&D. It has been large-scale offtake agreements by governments that have allowed the scaling up and therefore the lower cost reduction, which has driven that particular sector. We need to do this in lots of other areas. The scale of capital we have to invest in solutions is around $150 trillion US between now and 2050. That's a lot of money. But we are lucky because we have the capital available on the planet. In Japan, in China, in Europe, and in the US, we have managed to accumulate large pools of long-term capital in our pension funds and insurance funds. We have the capital. Incredible. At the same time as we have a species-defying problem, which is going to involve about $150 trillion of investment, not cost, we have the capital available to us. We have proof that capital will move. The green bonds market that I've been developing has grown from $2 billion outstanding to $4.3 trillion outstanding globally now. Hey, it's tiny. It needs to be 10 times that. But that is an extraordinary development. It's a proof of concept. The main problem we have everywhere around the world now is supply, is bonds that we can invest in. I can bring lots and lots of investors to play who will happily, happily participate in green finance. They simply don't have a product. And that's the real issue. So that's why KPMG's work is so important, because from my perspective, I don't care about the net zero bank transition plans. I simply care about green bonds being issued that my investor base can invest in. That's the good news. We've had a couple of wins. In 2021, the Biden Climate Fund pulled together major commitments by the world's developed countries around emissions reductions. Okay, so far so good. But it did one thing amongst the invest community because every major Western country committed, and then China and India, the back of it, investors now are of the view, right, the future will be green, the future has been decided. They're mainly concerned about now speed and winners and losers. How do they pick? Which company is going to survive this change that's coming through? But that's a win. There is now a belief that there is a tidal wave of change coming through the global economy. First, renewables, which we've seen already, hydrogen, but it applies to industrials, it applies to property sector, it applies to agriculture, land use, shipping, and aviation. Everywhere, everywhere, and around this COP, there is talk of what the change is going to be, not if it's going to happen. Even the oil and gas industry, even Exxon, has come out and tried to claim the space by putting big advertisements saying how they're part of the change. Unfortunately, their transition plan is nowhere near adequate enough, but we'll come back to that later. We've seen governments follow through with significant incentives. The IRA in the US, the Inflation Reduction Act, has been incredibly successful at generating investment 
around new technologies, especially, by the way, in Republican uh, Congress, congressional seats. 80% of the investment is happening in Republican seats, which means it won't be rolled back, even if the Republicans gain control of Congress. That's a very important thing to note about that one. But in Japan, the Green Transformation Plan, which is a 120 trillion yen program, is on a per capita basis the same size as the IRA. Huge, incredibly important, with massive electrification of the Japanese economy and clean energy. And then in Europe, we have similar programs. And in China also, China this year has already built more renewable energy than ever before in history. It has been for the last 16 years, the largest investor in renewable energy of any country in the world and continues to be so. There is more renewable energy capacity in China now than in Germany's entire electricity system and continues to grow. The other win we've had has been the understanding about risk. We've had a conversation at central banks going on for the last 10 years about the importance of addressing climate to mitigate future risk. The network for greening the financial system, an association of 140 central banks globally now, continues to publish more material around this. This is important because this means that every bank now has to take into account risk issues in their portfolios from the point of view of financial stability. It's not about doing something for the climate. It's about ensuring that they're not going to be negatively impacted by changes in the economy, negatively impacted by climate, climate impacts like flood, heat, or storms, and so on. These are material risks. By making it a risk discussion, central banks have taken it away from the ministries of climate change, where this issue was languishing for 20 years, and made it an issue for ministries of finance and treasuries, by the way. And then part of that has been taxonomy development. We've been central to taxonomy development for the last 10 years. We created the first climate bonds in 2012, helped the Chinese in 2014, and the European Commission ever since we've been driving taxonomy development, which has led to all sorts of other developments like disclosure regulation, which is driving banking changes in Europe, where banks and investors and corporations are now required each year to disclose their sustainability in line with the European taxonomy. A common language for what we do about climate change exists for the first time. 50 countries around the world are now working on taxonomies. We have this, this week published taxonomy developments with the Rwandan government, the Singaporean government, where Colombian government, the Australian government, and Hong Kong. It's also, we've also been working on their taxonomy for it. Guidance is becoming the norm. This is why I say it's actually a bit simpler than we think, because guidance about what to do is becoming reality. Transition is a new area. So clarity about what we need to do in steel and, and chemicals is now coming through, but it's still a work in progress. The third thing that's happened is incentives. First, the People's Bank of China introduced the requirement that all banks in China have to have 5% of their bond holdings as green bonds. That is a very powerful incentive, which has driven the Chinese green bond market. But in other countries, the Reserve Bank of India that we work with has brought in public sector lending requirements for green finance. The development banks of the world have now rolled out numerous green bond guarantee facilities. The Asian Development Bank is launching another one tomorrow around nature hubs and green bonds. This is now becoming the norm. We have an opportunity in Taipei, in Taiwan, which is this is a country that has a lot of fossil fuels. They've all got to go. And by the way, the taxonomy is forcing us to address some very difficult questions. One of the difficult questions has been the false stories we've been sold in the last 20 years about transition. The International Energy Agency said very clearly like early this year and again last year, there can be no new fossil fuel investments if we had a meter 1.5 degree trajectory. Nada, yet none. That is new gas as well as new coal. We will need to sweat our existing assets, but we must stop the drastic methane leakage problem that we now exist. We saw an announcement yesterday about that from the COP presidency. Change is happening. We need to change the energy system in Taiwan. We need to change the industrial base in Taiwan. We need to change the agricultural base in Taiwan to be aware, to address all of these problems. We need to make our economies everywhere around the world future fit. 
The reason I'm here is I think there's a chance that Taiwan could be a laboratory for the planet. We need laboratories. Singapore is becoming it. The government has decided to go deep green, has done amazing things just the last 12 months. We have Denmark doing the same, becoming a deep green country. Taiwan could do that. Could be part of a constellation of small countries that show the big countries exactly how to change very, very quickly. For that, we need you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Uh, have a seat, please. And also, Chappelle. Okay, uh, both of the speakers talk about the issue and also have some uh, thinking about the Taiwan. And, uh, okay, I have several questions and later on I will open to the audience. Uh, I will focus on, the first question will focus on the EU tax policy because last year we all know the EU tax policy uh, used the nuclear and fossil fuel such as gas as on a sustainable source of energy. It's, it makes us surprised about this. All, although we know it's uh, uh, because of the war of the Ukraine Russia war. No, no, no. Uh, maybe probably you can give us a very uh, explanation about this one, the, the situation. And uh, because lots of, lots of people think that nuclear power is uh, green energy. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me correct your misconceptions. I've been intimately involved in all of this. First, yes, a couple of years ago, Europe did allow a, a sliver of gas to be included. But understand that the conditionality with European seclusion is very, very tough. There will hardly any be. You can only build gas if you're replacing coal. You can only build gas to 15% of the generation capacity of coal. And you have to commit that that gas plant will be low carbon by 2035 in line with the International Energy Agency's net zero 1.5 degree pathway. These are critically important caveats to understand. This is not a message about gas being green. This is a message about meeting the IEA's tough transition pathways. And so far, we haven't seen any plans to qualify. So understand that. But even, even with that, they don't attract EU taxonomy. They cannot be under EU taxonomy, uh, gas plants. Uh, well, with those caveats, a gas plant could be, but it's very, very difficult, and there's been none so far. On nuclear, look, let's, let's not fuss around here. Nuclear is low carbon. There is no debate about that. It is very, very low carbon. What is going to kill the species is not nuclear. I'm not a big fan of current nuclear technologies. I'm working a lot in Japan at the moment. We, you know, Fukushima is a live issue for the population there. And I appreciate that in, in Taiwan, we've seen a capping of nuclear. But if you're going to close something, close fossil fuels before you close nuclear. I make this speech in Germany all the time. In Europe, we've recognized that. We've said nuclear is low carbon. The rules for building nuclear are quite tough. It is not an open blanket for nuclear. You need to address waste disposal, which is not being addressed very successfully around the world. However, we've understood that to achieve the transition for climate, the most important thing to do is to reduce emissions globally, and that's reflect on taxonomy. So yes, we count nuclear bonds as green bonds, and you'll see more of them coming through this year. But you know, the International Energy Agency, in its own modeling, the best forecast we can have for nuclear is 8% of global energy generation in 2050. This is a diversion, folks. Let's get on to the real issues. That's renewable energy. Yeah, Chopo. Um, well, on gas, I think we agree. On nuclear, maybe slight uh, nuance. Is nuclear low carbon or near zero carbon? Yes. Is nuclear clean energy? Question mark. Because indeed what you mentioned about waste. So for me, it's always about what is the boundary and where is the scope that we draw clean. If we are looking at operations, the actual operation of nuclear to generate electricity, we could say, yes, this is green operation. However, if we look at the, at, at the bit wider value chain of nuclear, no, we do have to recognize that today there is an issue post and even sometime pre with the mining, et cetera, et cetera but also post mainly where material issues still align. How do we treat the waste in order to make it clean for our environment, for our planet? This is why indeed it's absolutely absurd that certain country closed nuclear in order to, or maybe not in order, but basically carried on with, with coal in order to provide energy security, right? Nuclear do provide energy security. They are a great base power, right? Very efficient. So moving away from nuclear because of a certain 
emotional trend, but then replacing it with call, I think it's absurd, right? However, is coal, uh, sorry, is nuclear low carbon and need to attract certain funding in order to enable the transition? Definitely yes, right? Uh, where do, what do we, what do we label it? It, it becomes a matter of, of taxonomy uh, after all. Yeah, even if the COP28, several countries have the pledges, triple the nuclear power. What's the connection with the green finance? Well, again, I think it's a matter of terminology and it's a matter of taxonomy. So the EU has uh, uh, labeled uh, nuclear as green, uh, as green power in order to put it under the, the framework of EU taxonomy. So today, uh, uh, from an EU taxonomy perspective, uh, uh, money can be channeled to nuclear and can be can be labeled as as green. We just heard there will be green green climate bonds going there. We need to recognize again getting to net zero, solving our issues right, solving the issue of extension that uh, Sean just spoke about is not something that will happen tomorrow. It's a journey for the next twenty or so years, ideally not more than 20, 25 years, ideally. Otherwise, we're doomed, right? And Sean mentioned this very, very clearly. However, those 25 years, we need levers. We need transition levers to go through them. We are not off a cliff. We don't jump from 10 to zero straight away. And this is where doing pledges around tripling renewable energy, doubling energy efficiency, even nuclear, is quite powerful in our view. You ask a specific question around COP. Let's be clear. Nuclear qualifies as green on low carbon for the purposes of NDCs. There's no debate about that. Uh, the risks associated with nuclear are not to do with climate. climate. They're to do with what I call do no civic and harm risks enshrined in the European taxonomy as an idea. Different countries have to make their own decisions about can they deal with the waste issue and so on, and they may or may not include it. But it, it just it is low carbon. Let's be very clear about that. Does that mean that we're a fan of current existing technologies? We're not, because they're expensive, they're slow, and they have they clearly have operational risk. We've seen live experiments, right? So it doesn't seem like a sensible thing to do. The France has decided it's going to build a new fleet of nuclear power plants. Okay, they're green, they're low carbon. They're not going to come into operation in 2046. I mean, that is not a fast solution. A fast solution is the next seven years. No new nuclear plant will be built in the next seven years if it started now. But we can do a lot of solar, a lot of wind, even a lot of geothermal. And of course, in high earthquake zone areas like Taiwan, you've got a separate, a real dinosaur of harm risk. Are you putting facilities in an area where you increase the risk of accident? That's just like lunacy, isn't it? <laughs> okay, thank you. We open the question to the public. Anyone have a questions? Have questions or comment? Okay, please. Uh, my name is Wang Chun. I'm a reporter from Taiwan. So, uh, as you all know, that countries have a pledge to uh triple, uh, nuclear power, right? So, I, what I, what I want to ask is that uh, because you are talking about climate bounds, right? Will there be more and more green bounds that, uh, meant to set up for nuclear power plants around the world? And like how much of the scale will be of that market? Thank you. There will be more green bonds for nuclear. Canada has just done, just done one. China will do more. Korea will do more. Will it be large? No. Are investors hanging out for nuclear bonds? No. They're worried about the risks in some countries. In France, they are. In Germany, they are. So it varies a little bit. So no, this is a this is a diversion. You know, it'll be part of the mix. As I said, the IEA says the maximum we can get to in terms of local nuclear capacity, global nuclear capacity by 2050 is about eight percent because there are fuel constraints. The various hey, new technologies. There's a lot of VC money going into fusion at the moment. It might work. I mean, fusion has been the thing that's always five years away. It's been like that for 40 years, I think. So well, I'm not holding out any any promises for it. SMRs look interesting, small modular nuclear reactors. It might work. These are not going to be big capex items. Where's the big capex going to be in the terms of investors? It's going to be in solar, in the energy sector, in wind, in grid connections, 
we have to quadruple electrification of the planet between now and 2050. It's going to be in green hydrogen. We have about a $10 trillion pipeline of investments in hydrogen and ammonia generated from renewables, which will replace fertilizer generated by gas around the world and shipping fuels and so on. There are many other things we've got to worry about way more important than nuclear. Um, I have a question. You mentioned about, if I, if I noted correctly, about $4 trillion at the moment uh, under CBI, right? Uh, if I, so the bonds that you mentioned, uh, nuclear bonds, Canada, France, what is their value uh, in the context of the $4 trillion? It's um, in the uh, tens of billions. Still, still, still quite small. Yeah, very clear uh, identification because when we talk about a nuclear before, lots of the political issue and uh, this talk we from the uh, green finance point of view is totally different. So, anyway, you want to have a comment? Yeah. I have one question for both of you. Uh, Sean, you mentioned that taxonomy drive the banker to change. And then now I think a lot of pressure on uh, the financial institutions, disclosure, transparency, on um, how they align with or complying with the EU taxonomy. And then the taxonomy has already spread out very fast. And a lot of, just like you mentioned, a lot of Asian countries already also leveraged uh, the existing, uh, some of the background expertise and to develop their own taxonomy. But uh, how about, can you just predict then what will be by 2030, uh, how taxonomy, because we know that even, even right now at EU is just only at the very beginning, a couple of sector and then six up environmental objective, but the current uh, clear taxonomy just only focus on uh, some specific environmental objective. So still have a, a long way to develop a comprehensive to covering uh, to cover all of uh, the different uh, environmental objectives and all of the sector. And then uh, can you just share, and also, uh, uh, can also share that according uh, to your observation, how uh, impact will be to the bankers to become much more transparent and really to uh, leverage the taxonomy to try the uh, uh, the much more impactful consequence uh, based on their finance. Uh, so, can you share with us about the uh, this kind of a situation? Well, first one key misconception: the EU taxonomy covers more than eighty percent of the EU economy. Right? There are two hundred and forty-three segments that are covered, not just a few. So, it's a very broad ranging. There are some areas that aren't covered: agriculture because the member states couldn't agree. They had too many arguments. So work to be done. We have have a broad agriculture into the many other taxonomies around the world anyway. So work does proceed apace, from the first point. There are many issues we've got to address to create a sustainable society. You know, we need to ensure circular economy, resource management. We need to make sure that we rebuild our natural biodiversity, which we've demolished over the last 50 years globally. There are many factors, all of which we consider pertinent to the response to climate change. However, the first and primary things we have to do are around mitigation, around emissions, getting emissions down, and then preparing for the crises that of, are of, going to start now, heat, pandemics, etc., which are all part of it. We cover many of those things in the taxonomy. We are continuing to do more work on it. Taxonomies have now been published all around the world. As I said, Hong Kong and Singapore and Thailand and Malaysia and Indonesia, just some of the more recent ones. For banks, you said something important. You said banks have to be thinking about engagement. We would argue, and I'm doing a, a, a seminar for Jap Japanese banks tomorrow about this, we would argue the primary indicator for banks is not their carbon footprint. I disagree because it's too complicated. You know, by the time, I mean, we looked at how you manage the carbon impact of a trading desk. Honestly, it is what you'd call a problem that needs AI. <laughs> it is impossible to figure out, too difficult. We could spend 30 years coming up metrics for banks around their financed emissions. We can do something very quickly. 
we can look at banks' clients and how many banks of the have sorry how many of those clients are addressing transition, are preparing, who's actually done, and then we can have some assessment about the quality of transition plans, which is coming through as you talked about of SPTI and so on. That engagement metric is for me the most important metric because banks are enablers rather than the direct builders of power plants the like. And, and that's how this will play down. So when it comes down to reporting under the European taxonomy, banks are required to report on the sustainable investments they made, which is not the same as carbon emissions. How many, what percentage of their portfolio is exposed to renewables? It's already getting simpler. And the next metric will be around transition plans and what their clients are doing. That's, that's doable. For the underlying companies, of course, we need to have the reality of those transition plans, annual reporting, metrics that are linked to actual capital investment plans, action plans, and all these things. That work is the, the groundwork that's got to be done. Okay. Um, I would like to extend what you said, not to repeat, but very much similar to CBI. If we treat regulations, taxonomies, as enabler to drive green finance and provide clarity and transparency in the market, it's great. We need to be careful by using reporting as the drive because there we open a lot of rooms to use the wrong lever to start labeling things just to report on them. And I believe CBI, you stand in the front and not at the end of this, of this chain. So basically you say, According to these criteria, you can issue a bond and then, okay, at the end, KPMGs, we do, we do a lot of uh, CBI uh, uh, assurance, and then, yes, it ends up in a report. If you position at the reporting, then what you, the risk, and this is what we see a lot, is that if the reporting is the stick or the carrot, then banks or other institutions or other organizations start to see how can I fit things in order to put in a reporting box? So a lot of today regulatory work, especially in Europe, is trying to close those loopholes from both ends of, let's say, this, this, this funnel. You, we have the EU taxonomy, and Sean, you mentioned the EU taxonomy led to other disclosures, and at the end we have also the disclosures coming up in order to really provide this transparency in the markets. Now, ultimately, banks, right, follow the economy, follow their portfolio companies, right? So banks can push and then can claim how they are engaging or how they are incentivizing or how much ultimately finance they are providing. But it's not up to the banks to claim how much carbon they are reducing. Because let me tell you very simply, banks can sit on their hands right green uh, 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 green infrastructure let's say go low carbon grids go low carbon their portfolio company benefit de facto and the banks say yeah my portfolio went down they haven't done anything on that so let's be careful also or the messages should be very clear on what do you report on and how to use the reporting right not as a marketing engine but really meet the beginning of the funnel in order to report what you are doing against the initial criteria. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to finish all the, this session and uh, thank you all the thank two speakers. Thank you, give a prof. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Take a photo, please. Yeah. Without, uh, yeah, yeah, here. Here, here, here. Okay. So here.